and start walking us through so we can talk about the integrated water resources plan. Um, so again, I'm gonna pass it over. We've got two guest speakers today um, that we're excited to have. One is Barry Gullett. Um, a lot of you may know Barry if you've been engaged with the water management group. That's a name that's not that's not new for you all. I always kind of call him like the man, the myth, the legend. He's Barry Gullett. He is kind of he is, uh, really the the start of this academy was something that he really worked on. And so we worked together for several years on executing the academy. This is my this is the first time we've done it. And, and Brett and Vicky have really stepped up to help um, make sure that it ex executed just as smoothly. So I'm really excited to have Barry back talk a little bit about the initial um, stages of the water supply master plan um, and then how that is um, segue into the integrated water resources plan. And then we have Sarah Ye, who is a project manager for water resources here at HDR. Um, we're so alongside me as well. And she's going to talk more about like, where we are today, what are, what's, gonna, what's been taking place in the last two years, as well as what's coming up in the next three years as we work to update the, um, the plan. And so before I pass it over to Barry, I did want to just play a quick video. This was um, was developed a couple years ago, but I think it does provide a good kind of background understanding of the um, of the plan and, and how it got started. So um, I'm going to ask uh, Sarah to give me a thumbs up as it starts to make sure you guys can hear the sound. The people who live in the Catawba River Basin depend on the Catawba River for their water supply, for their electricity for recreation, for aesthetics, for the environmental benefits. Without the Catawba River and the water and the amenities that it brings with it, there wouldn't be the quality of life that we enjoy in this region. If we keep doing things the way we've been doing them and the patterns of the past continue, somewhere around the middle of this century, we will in fact reach the capacity of the river. And what that means is that we would not be able to add new houses. We would not be able to build new industries. We wouldn't be able to attract growth and development and sustain the economic vitality that we've enjoyed for so long in this area. The Catawba Watery Water Management Group is a nonprofit corporation that was formed in 2007. And we are the, the organizations and the businesses who take water out of the river on behalf of our customers for all the things that people use water for. The Catawba Watery Water Management Group's goals and objectives are really to do projects and do work that will help the Catawba River be preserved and will make it more useful as a water supply source for a longer period of time so that the, this region can continue to prosper. The main objective of the Basin Wide Water Supply Master Plan is to extend the life of the Catawba River, to make it last longer. Without the river and lake system, our prospects as a region for future economic development would be significantly limited. The water supply plan uh, projects that by 2065, the net withdrawal from the river basin will be 419 million gallons a day. That's 122% increase above the current net withdrawal of 189 million gallons a day. In the future, these additional water supplies will be needed to support population growth we expect additional people to move here to this region, certainly over time. We also hope and expect to have new businesses come, whether they're manufacturing facilities or data centers or other commercial ventures. And because of those additional uses, we're gonna need more electricity production. This water supply master plan considers all of those potential uses and needs and provides a vision for how we can meet them. I think it's very important to think about those future generations and to do the right things for them. This water supply master plan is just that. The water supply master plan looks comprehensively at what exactly is out there uh, currently today, what are the needs going to be in 10, 20, 50, 100 years, and how are we best able to utilize uh, this natural resource and what's the way that we can sustain it into the future as long as we can. We have one of the fastest growing communities as a whole, uh, if you look at the Carolinas. Um, and I think we can sustain that. And I think the key to that is getting ahead of it before you have problems. So I think short term, let's put the plan in place. Let's start creating programs and design changes to the way we do business, the way we live. But let's also start looking at in the future. How do we make sure that five years, 10 years from now, we're looking at new ways to do the same thing uh, to make sure that we can sustain it and move it on out even longer. Having a plan in place now in good times means when the tough times come, we've already agreed this is what we're going to do. 
Tell me. So I'm gonna pass it to Barry. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for having me back. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to this group. And that video kind of takes me back. Um, Sabrina was, was very kind when she said it was a couple of years ago. Um, I think it was probably more like eight or 10 years ago. <laughs> but um, but anyway, let me talk a little bit about what was going on in those days and um, how the water supply study. Um, well, there was a there was two projects. There's the water supply study and then there's the water supply master plan. And the um, the water supply study was done during Duke energy's FERC relicensing project, which I'm sure y'all have talked about. But before that um, before that took place and, and came out in 2006, nobody really knew how much water we could take out of the Catawba River on a sustainable basis. And everybody kind of looked at it and saw all the water in Lake Norman and Lake Wiley and all of the other uh, reservoirs up and down the, the basin and said, look, there's no way we're gonna run out of water, we got plenty. But we were kind of fooling ourselves, and so when we, um, when Duke undertook the the water supply study as part of relicensing, we were all a little bit surprised at the finding. And the finding was is that if we kept doing what we were doing, we were going to run out of water. And that didn't mean the lakes were going to be dry, but it meant that we wouldn't be able to reliably depend on the Catawba River to support new growth, new users, new customers, and so. Um, None of us found that to really be acceptable. So that was in 2006. Um, the water management group, Catawba Water and Water Management Group, was, was incorporated in December of 2007. And we started out with a, um, with a list of projects that we wanted to undertake. And we really didn't know exactly where we were going. But uh, it didn't take us long to recognize that we needed to be laying the groundwork for understanding more about what the capacity of the river system really is. And so we started out with um, a couple of a really significant uh, projects and they uh, they were they were uh, some of them were kind of small, but one of them in particular was really, really big and really important. And it was we called it the safe yield study. And the the purpose of it was really to to kind of confirm that what we were doing with the modeling that took place in the uh, in the 2006 water supply study was appropriate, and that we were considering all the right things. And were we doing this safe yield work the same way that other people were doing it? And so we partnered with the uh, Water Research Foundation, which is um, probably one of the most preeminent um, water related research groups in the world. Uh, they're based out of Denver, Colorado. And they took over the project as, a, as the project manager and they set up a, a project task force that included people from literally all over the world and took a deep dive into the situation that uh, we were dealing with here in the Carolinas and how it really related to the rest of the world. And so um, they looked at, at 21 river basins across the US and the world. Some of those river basins are the, the biggest ones in this country and some smaller ones too uh, that have multi-purpose uh, uses. Uh, they have multiple reservoirs, uh, power generation, uh, water supply source, and, and all the kinds of things that we're dealing with in the Catawba. So it included like the Arkansas River, the Colorado, the Columbia, the Danube, the Delaware River, the Mekong River Basin, and the Murray Darling River Basin, which is in Australia. And the result of that was that um, they found that that our approach um, was as uh, appropriate as it could be, and was uh, was a very sophisticated approach, and ranked right up there with what the rest of the world was doing. So that gave us some confirmation. They did make a couple of recommendations. They recommended that we incorporate climate change and probabilistic approaches to um, 
to quantifying uncertainty. And so we did both of those things in the original water supply master plan, but we're doing even more of those in the integrated uh, water resources plan that Sarah's going to talk about in a few minutes. But the, um, the, the water supply master plan originally was published in May of 2014. So that's seven years after the, um, the water management group was formed. And again, during that time, we were laying the groundwork uh, for, for doing this. We were doing, we did sedimentation studies. We did lots of things that we needed to fill the data gaps to be sure that the modeling that we were doing covered all the bases. And so we laid that groundwork. We got the uh, project underway. The project itself took several years to complete and it was very expensive. At that point in time, the budget for the water management group was about half a million dollars a year. And the project, uh, the water supply master plan project on its own was nearly three times that. And so we really had to find some funding partners and we were successful in that. Uh, we were able to get funding from, uh, from the, the two states, North Carolina and South Carolina, as well as the Duke Energy uh, Foundation, not Duke Energy the, the, as, a, as a utility, but their nonprofit uh, foundation that, um, that was able to help, help us some. And so going forward, we're hoping that we can get, in fact, we already have uh, gotten some funding from South Carolina and are expecting some from North Carolina. And part of that is driven by the Supreme Court case uh, that came around and was actually filed in 2007, about the same time that the water management group was being formed. And if you were around in this part of the world in those days, there were two really controversial things going on. One was we were having a drought and water supply was in question for the whole basin. And the second thing that was going on was interbasin transfer. And that was being driven in part by the drought because some of the areas that were adjacent to us, particularly Concord and Kannapolis, who were over in the Rocky River Basin, wanted to get water from the Catawba. And that was very controversial. A lot of work went into that process. Uh, there were multiple court cases filed uh, in the state over that uh, project. And then finally, that really culminated with South Carolina suing North Carolina uh, over, uh, they called equitable distribution or equitable appropriation of the water. And so that Supreme Court case, there was a lot of work done on it, a lot of data gathered, a lot of presentations made. Uh, there were oral arguments made in front of the Supreme Court about who could actually participate in the case. And then finally in uh, 2010, that course, court case was settled um, by an agreement between the two states. And one of those, um, one of the requirements of that settlement was is that, that the water supply study should be updated at least every 10 years. And it should be done in cooperation with the Catawba Water Rewater Management Group. And so that 10 year period is coming around. So we had the first update was really the, uh, the water supply master plan, which updated the 2006 water supply study. And so now we need to get the, uh, the update of that done, um, I guess by 2025. And so that's what uh, the water management group and working with HDR are um, hard at work doing right now and what Sarah's going to talk about when I get finished running my mouth here. So, um, so that was a, a big driver and it helped us get the funding that we needed for uh, the first one. And it implies that there will be funding coming from both states going forward for these updates every 10 years, but it is not specific at all about how much or how it's calculated or whatever. So. Um, I believe the price tag, the last price tag I heard on the uh, the current integrated water resources plan was about a million and a, about a million and a half uh, dollars. And so we're hoping that uh, the two states will each chip in a third and the water management group will chip in a third from our own revenues. And so, so far, South Carolina has already stepped up to the plate on that, uh, still working on North Carolina and the water management group is budgeting for its share of it. So. 
Um, so let me move on to the to the master plan itself. Um, and so it included a lot of different elements. It included uh, actually finding the funding because we didn't have it really a clue where it was going to come from when we first started talking about this. Um, we know it knew it needed stakeholder input. We wanted to update the water use projections, make those a little more um, uh, long term. We wanted to refine the hydrologic model that's called KEOPS. Y'all probably already talked about that. Um, we wanted to uh, look at climate change impacts per the for the uh, safe yield report recommendations. We wanted to uh, uh, look at a lot of different options and how we could manage this so that we would not run out of water. The overall purpose of the study was find a way to extend the usefulness of the Catawba River as a water supply source beyond the year 2100. And so we were successful in doing that, um, but we had some other guidelines that we were following too. We wanted the um, we wanted the the plan, and this is a plan. It's not a study. It's a plan, and we wanted the plan to result in very practical recommendations, things that were doable, achievable, that used existing technology, not something that was somebody hoped would happen down the road twenty years, but something that's actually uh, in use today. And we we wanted all the recommendations had to be consistent with the uh, comprehensive relicensing agreement and Duke's FERC license. So those were the parameters that we were working with. So we established a stakeholder advisory team um, that included uh, a number of different people. We couldn't include all of the individuals that we really wanted to because that would have taken us back to the relicensing days with 160 or 180 people and we just really couldn't manage that. So we wound up with a a stakeholder advisory team that we tried to get um, representatives from groups who represented bigger constituencies. So we had folks like the Catawba uh, Regional Council of Governments, uh, several other Council of Governments. Uh, we had the uh, Marine Commissions, uh, the Division of Water Resources, Wildlife Resources Commission, South Carolina DHEC, South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. Uh, we had uh, the North Carolina Conservation Fund. We had a couple of towns and counties. We had Resolute Forest Products, International Paper, and Siemens Westinghouse uh, on our stakeholder advisory team. And they were uh, were very helpful and, and helped to move us along through the project. Um, so we, uh, we finished the project up. And it was published, like I said earlier, in, in May of 2014. And we really had a lot of discussion about what to do with it after we finished it. We wanted it to be implemented. We really did not want this to just be another notebook on everybody's shelf. And so several of us started a road tour. Um, the larger uh, utility members, um, Charlotte Rock Hill and a few others, presented the plan to their governing boards on their own. But most of the towns uh, elected to have um, some folks from HDR and some folks from the uh, water management group, which um, usually included uh, Jeff Leinberger and myself and uh, a few others. And we went to every one of those um, governing boards uh, and presented the uh, the results of the plan, and answered their questions, and asked them to sign a resolution to adopt a resolution supporting the plan. And I will say that we were very successful, that every one of our member organizations uh, did adopt a resolution supporting the plan. I'll also say that the, the world was a little different back in those days, and at nearly every one of those presentations that we did, there was someone there who spoke against it same person usually, and um, I will, I'm not going to talk about who that was, but I will say that the working relationship between that person who opposed it um, and that group that opposed it actually, and the water management group now is much, much, much better. And um, so we're moving forward in a little different environment today than we did before. And the reason that, um, 
and it was opposed by this group was they didn't believe we had gone far enough and they wanted to see um, more uh, work by Duke Energy in terms of conserving water. But again, they were asking us to include technologies and include things that weren't uh, in use today. They were out on the future horizon somewhere and that wasn't consistent with the goals and the parameters that we started to study with. So uh, some of those have changed now. And so those will be looked at again with the integrated water resources plan, I'm sure. So the results of the plan were pretty simple. There were really four key recommendations and they're fairly common sense. There was a lot of work that went into determining whether these would be adequate to meet our goal of water supply beyond 2100. And so the four were, we needed to increase our water use efficiency. In other words, how much, uh, how much use we're getting out of every gallon of water. The second criteria was we needed to physically lower the critical water intakes on several of the reservoirs. Uh, every reservoir has a critical elevation below which uh, somebody runs out of water. It's either a power plant or a municipality or an industry. The third recommendation was is to raise the target lake levels during the summer months on a few of the lakes. And um, that was that is dependent on some other improvements that Duke is doing, including the uh, um, the dam improvements at Lake Watery. But uh, there's been a lot of work done, and I believe it's actually been approved by FERC uh, going forward. So that that should be happening. And the last one was to enhance our drought responsiveness through the low inflow protocol. And so we've got processes built in. Thank goodness we haven't had to implement the low inflow protocol in some number of years now. But there's this kind of a standing project with the water management group that if we do, and when we, it's not an if, it's when we do need to implement it the next time that we do a comprehensive review of how well it worked and did it, uh, did it meet its goals. And so that's also a part of um, the integrated water resources plan is being sure that it's still adequate to meet our goals. So those were the, the key recommendations. We're making good progress on those. And this is an example, the water use efficiency recommendations. When we started this work in 2006, the basin wide average for the amount of water used per capita uh, by residential users in the whole basin was 113 gallons per person per day. Um, there were a lot of things going on that started driving that number down. Uh, the low flow protocol was one, the droughts really re-educated folks about how efficient they could be with water. And so by, by the, um, by 2011, we were already down to 85 gallons per person per day in the basin. And our target from the first water supply master plan is 70. So you can see we still had a ways to go and I think we're still making progress. I haven't seen the latest numbers on that. I've been kind of out of circulation for a little while now, but I think we're still making progress on that. And that's not for a particular utility, that's for the entire basin. And so to give you an, uh, an example, uh, back in the early what, 2008 range, um, the Charlotte Mecklenburg system was still averaging about 100 gallons per person per day. And so they still have a, a target to to reduce that. So that is kind of the um, summary of the first water supply master plan. And one of the things that we talked about the whole time we were doing that plan was all the things that we weren't doing, that we weren't looking at, things like the economic impact and water quality and things that uh, now are being brought into play with the integrated water resources plan, which really seeks to pull all of those things together into, uh, into one plan. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah and she's gonna talk about the integrated water resources plan, which is the new name for the water supply master plan. Yes, thank you, Barry, uh, for, for covering so thoroughly the water supply master plan because branded as the Integrated Water Resources Plan is really building on that foundation in progress and then incorporating the new elements, as he said, especially focusing in on, on some elements like water quality. 
So in order to help drive this update to the plan, we started in 2021, so just about two years ago now. And the first step uh, towards that planning process was really to take a moment and think about how are we going to uh, further expand this plan? What do we need to consider that wasn't done in the previous version and, and really um, produce the most actionable and useful plan for the organization moving forward? And in order to do that, there were a series of workshops that held a, quite a few participants um, with a lot of brainstorming and ideas from a wide variety of sectors brought in stakeholders from, um, from within the water management group, but also many uh, outside to, to share a wide variety of ideas. And if we'll go to the next slide, you can see that we were able to organize all of those voices and thoughts into six kind of key themes of, of what this plan wanted to achieve uh, moving forward. Uh, first, was bucketed as communication and education, ensuring that key stakeholders, including policymakers that are able to implement any of the recommendations coming out of the plan and the general public is educated throughout the process of the plan's development and has a, has a key plan for how to roll that out into the future to prompt action. Uh, Another key theme from that listening session or a series of listening sessions was collaboration and consistency. This, the water management group is made up of many entities and it covers um, a fairly large geographical area with many users. And so as we include data and make recommendations for new ways to use data and actions to use a common language, and uh, utilize our efforts in a way that's consistent across the whole basin and is able to adapt to the variations of different policies uh, throughout those different areas, as well as being able to share that data um, more widely and, and be in that collaborative spirit amongst many competing water resource needs. A third key theme was for implementation and evaluation mechanisms. And here is where what Barry mentioned as far as bringing in an element of economic evaluation was a, a key recommendation for how we can further augment this version of the water resources plan, including evaluation mechanisms that take a look at what the economic impact may be for the various uh, water supply uh, or water quality recommendations moving forward may be for the members, um, their um, consumers or, or customers, and then also impacts uh, it measured in an economic sense for the wider community, whether that's recreationally or other value towards potential growth. Water quantity and availability uh, is, is really the, the key backbone. Uh, when you heard Barry talk about the history of how um, these plans have come together and the studies leading up towards it, um, always staying front of mind is the incredible value of what the Catawba Watery River supplies as far as water availability to support so many different users throughout. So keeping that key theme front and center is, is of course a very important towards this effort, um, but also doing it in a way that incorporates more elements of potential climate changes in how we consider how in the long term our historic expectation of uh, rainfall patterns in both amount and in timing um, may be variable from what we've experienced in the recent past. And that can also drive how we expect future drought conditions to occur, um, especially thinking about temperature changes over time. Water quality is a big piece of how this plan is expanding um, in far, insofar as developing an integrated plan that is encompassing 
not only water quantity and timing and availability, but what is the quality of that available water um, for our users? And incorporating elements of how we consider our, our land uses and uh, how we leverage the basin and the watershed as a whole and impacting water quality throughout the, the region as far as as well including recommendations towards um, really focusing on water quality efforts, not just um, strategies for extending water availability. And finally was an emphasis on realistic planning for the future. And that helps us uh, think about the climate change aspect that I've already mentioned but as well including more uh, variability and, and probabilistic uh, strategies as Barry mentioned as far as the recommendation from that Water Resources Foundation study um, into how we uh, implement our forecasts for what we anticipate future needs for the basin being. Um, when we think about forecasting um, water demands and needs and where that's going to be with throughout the water basin, uh, the entire Catawba Watery Basin, um, we need to take into consideration and leverage quite a few different factors so that we have a realistic um, baseline expectation for what that future could include. All right. And then when we incorporate all of those, kind of that listening session with all of these ideas and trying to carry through how we can incorporate those themes into the plan. Um, there's a wide variety of kind of more specific elements that were, were drawn out of that discussion. A few that I really wanted to highlight was uh, thinking about how the basin is now in a different um, situation than we were in 2014. You know, we're, we're coming up towards 10 years on a 10 year cycle of updates. So we want to reflect the changes that the basin includes. And, and part of that is including expansion of any of the additional members to the water management group, but also incorporating our previous uh, planning studies extended to the base of Lake Watery. But there's further users um, below Lake Watery and uh, want to make sure that we incorporate that geographical region between the bottom of Lake Watery and to the confluence of the Watery with the Congaree River. So we have a couple additional users um, that we're, we're incorporating there. Another thing that we're doing as far as the integrated water resources plan and where we are in time is simultaneous to the water management group's efforts. Uh, the state of South Carolina is, uh, has a river basin council and is uh, embarking and is amidst uh, a statewide effort to develop a river basin plan for each of its basins, one of which includes um, the watery. So um, part of the effort is to ensure, uh, as, as it's so-called here, don't trip across the line. We have a geographical boundary and there's some collaboration that needed to take place in order to uh, ensure we're not creating kind of two different river basin plans for the same area. And uh, we're very glad just in the past two months or so, um, the Catawba Water Water Management Group and leadership has worked with the South Carolina River, South Carolina river Basin Council to uh, uh, make some decisions so that the, uh, the water management group's integrated water resources plan can help satisfy the South Carolina's river basin planning needs um, and not and, and reduce any sort of need for a duplication of effort. Another element I wanna focus in on there is um, just that we're tackling in those tough water quality issues. And I referenced water quality earlier and there's so many different areas that you can cover within water quality. Um, and a part of that has to do with many different constituents. And I know you all have probably talked at length about a couple of those different areas of water quality issues in the basin, but wanted, wanted to highlight that 
There's modeling that's included um, as far as movement of nutrients, sediment throughout the basin, but also we're, we're going to include a variety of elements as far as um, harmful algal blooms, thinking about viruses and uh, contaminants of emerging concern. Um, with that, thanks Sabrina. So all of those different elements are being packed in together into the development of the integrated water resources plan. Uh, nicely enough on this figure, we are right here in the middle on year three uh, in 2023. And that is a midway point on our five year uh, process. In the beginning was our basis of planning efforts. We talked a little bit about scoping and thinking about what elements are going into the plan and determining the forecast of water demand. In the second year was uh, a, a revamp and refresh of the KEOPS model um, that Barry mentioned um, in part, but a large focus as well on the waterfall model developed by RTI for the basin so that we're able to leverage uh, a rainfall runoff model of the basin. And that really is a, a big piece of how we're able to increase our knowledge and um, evaluations of water quality issues. Year three, which, which we're amongst now, um, has those detailed evaluations and for the model updates to think about water quantity. And then for year four, we'll use those evaluations to produce recommendations so that in year five, we can package those all together and create clear recommendations and products so that we can share um, the results of the planning process with all stakeholders. And to, to just dive a little bit deeper in to the progress, um, as I mentioned, year one uh, in 2021, uh, those projections and uh, of water demand were a huge piece of that effort, as well as identifying which of the key water quality constituents were priorities and, and what strategies did we wanna take, what level of detail did we want these evaluations to take? And so that we were able to progress further in year two in 2022, um, to make those model updates um, link together our, our, our models and begin to develop our external stakeholder group um, so that we're able to engage both our regulatory partners, um, but also gain feedback from others throughout the basin who have a voice um, and a need for, for water, clean and plentiful water throughout the basin. And that's what leads us now to year three where we're really kicking off and facilitating the stakeholder advisory team. Um, they were able to have their first kickoff meeting here this past January. Um, and beyond the stakeholder advisory team, we're also focusing on developing a comprehensive strategic marketing plan to communicate the integrated water resources plan and keep our, our channels open with a wide variety of end users that, that we'll need to leverage the plan. Updating um, our models, conducting water quantity and quality evaluations during this time. This year three is really where we're diving into the meat of evaluations so that we're able to look at water quantity, water quality, and one additional piece um, is we focus mainly on our rivers and our reservoirs, but there is certainly an interaction with um, how our surface waters uh, move and uh, vary with groundwater. Um, so leveraging some information as far as groundwater monitoring throughout the basin and developing that economic analysis framework so that we're able to really uh, conduct those evaluations to provide uh, the context of what the economic impacts will be for these kinds of changes that we may suggest. And then that will lead us on to year four and five, which uh, this you can see on the screen here, there's a variety of specific points, but they all point towards in year four, um, incorporating our management strategies based on what we've evaluated and um, bringing together recommendations from 
a wide variety of potential management strategies, looking at point source pollution, non-point source pollution, looking at different strategies for water quantity movement, whether that's interbasin transfers, considering regulatory drivers to how that may impact them, um, or, or gather more information as far as monitoring collaboration or sampling. And those can all be packaged together with that regional economic impacts evaluation to help provide additional context towards the utility of those recommendations. So that when we have our year five, 2025, hitting us right there on the 10 year update cycle, we're able to really implement our communications plan, uh, roll out our production of the report and provide um, more interactive um, type plan features such as a story map and web um, kind of geographical interfaces so that more folks are able to engage with both the planning process, the recommendations, and be able to leverage those and understand it um, in, in, in a more uh, tangible format uh, for, for other future uses. So that's an overview of the plan itself. And we touched on as well, the stakeholder advisory team that just kicked off in uh, this past January. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time focusing in on who is a part of that. Um, Barry mentioned that the, the, the previous um, plan had a stakeholder advisory team and just as well that this update does as well. And we're covering a broad variety of sectors, which you can see on the screen in bold, um, as well as the individual organizations who have agreed to participate in uh, the bulleted points. The, uh, we have 18 members altogether. A couple of these are specifically highlighted um, and mandated for inclusion based on that Supreme Court case settlement um, that we referred to earlier. But otherwise, there was a, a very concerted effort from the water management group uh, to ensure that we're including uh, perspectives from the community in many different areas. And we're also effectively able to leverage the stakeholder advisory team to fulfill the needs of that South Carolina river basin planning process that I mentioned earlier as well. So we have a good spread um, and representation, not just by um, uh, commercial sector or, or niche, but also geographical spread as well. So, with that, um, I believe that is all of the slides I had for today, um, but we really welcome any questions to myself and Barry and I'll, I'll pass it back to Sabrina.